Hello, and welcome back to Bombchu. Today we'll be taking a look at the Humble Choice Bundle from August 2020. What's that? The music. Yes, it's back for this month to celebrate the artist's birthday. There's a link to his SoundCloud down below. Send him some love. Back to the bundle, it's a doozy, with a sneak peek, two Humble Originals, and if you're on the Classic or Premium plan, all 12 games are up for grabs this month. No having to decide what to drop. So what are we waiting for? Let's see what's in there. One of this month's Humble Originals is Booth, a sort of narrative puzzle simulation game developed by Undercurrent Games. Booth takes place in a dystopian future society, where the worldwide food supply has been threatened, and every major country's borders have been shut down. The player takes control of a newly appointed food inspector, whose job it is to make sure the food supplies coming into the country aren't counterfeit, dangerous, or suspicious in any way. Gameplay reminds me a lot of Papers, Please, in that you're doing a somewhat monotonous job in a dystopian setting that has you questioning every order given to you. As a food inspector, you'll be checking food and other food-related items as they come down a conveyor belt. At the start, you'll be checking food for weight and color, and disposing of anything that doesn't fit the guidelines. As the game progresses, your tasks start to get more complicated, and it gets hectic pretty quick. Luckily, you have the ability to slow down time a few times each day, allowing you to get things back in order pretty quickly. In between shifts, you'll need to make sure your living quarters are stocked with food, order decorations for your living space, other items to keep you entertained, and more importantly, conduct some kind of investigation. At night, the character keeps talking about trying to escape the country, but given that parts of the story are told out of order, it's still a little unclear to me exactly what's going on. During the day, you'll come across different people, either working at the facility, delivering food to your room, or other officers and officials keeping an eye on things. Through these conversations, you start to unlock clues as to who they are and what's really going on in the bigger picture. While the gameplay is okay, the story and world are what really drew me into Booth. The art style is simplistic but expressive, and also reminds me of Papers, Please. The music is intriguing, as it will go from lo-fi vibes to ominous dystopian shock music at a moment's notice. While some of the music you can play during Worth is cringe-inducing and unnerving to listen to, it really helps establish the atmosphere and world of Booth, and it's a great touch. Booth was not at all what I expected from the name or the unassuming title screen, but I'm kind of fascinated by what this game actually is. The story is interesting enough that I want to see where it goes, even if the translation is sometimes not so good. If you enjoyed Papers, Please and can find the hidden beauty in a dystopian near-future setting, you'll definitely want to check out Booth. This month's sneak peek is Wildfire, a side-scrolling stealth game with a focus on controlling the elements and beautiful pixel art. Hot damn, look at that fire. That is some pretty fire right there. So jumping right into the game, long story short, your village is attacked, and you take on the power to control the elements, starting with fire. You can use it to, you know, burn stuff. Grass, wood, people. You can take fire from a nearby source and throw it as a ball. You'll get upgrades to your power, like the ability to bounce the fireball on non-flammable surfaces, as well as the ability to consume it for a rocket jump. On its own, the element system is pretty cool, but this is coupled with a stealth game, where you can't do much to fight back against enemies if you're caught. At least not initially. You'll have to hide in tall grass, lure guards, and sneak your way to your objective. Avoiding detection and not killing guards rewards you with points that you can spend to upgrade your elemental abilities. It's a really cool game, and also still a bit buggy. For example, in one level I was holding onto a chicken, which allowed me to glide through the air. When I touched a checkpoint, I got lit on fire for some reason, died, respawned with the chicken, and could no longer glide. I'd recommend trying it regardless, and hopefully the bugs will get worked out before launch. This month's second Humble Original is Zodiac XX, an arcade-style flight sim from developer Virtuoso Neo Media. Let me cut to the chase here. Zodiac XX sucks. It's unbelievably bad. Like, from moment zero, when the soundtrack blasts you in the face, it's like the game is just shouting at you to witness me! I already have a headache, and I've barely gotten through the menu. However, as they say, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, so let's give it a chance, shall we? Alright, let's get this tutorial started and... Oh my god, I'm gonna barf. Why is the camera that sensitive? What the hell are these visuals? Did I die and go to 9Giz Arcade Hell? It certainly feels that way, because every aspect of this game is like torture. Your ship's movement is incredibly erratic, and moving left or right seems to constantly cause you to spiral either up or down as well. 
To top off this rancid garbage pile of gameplay, I even managed to run out of ammo during the very first mission, leaving me to try and kamikaze my remaining targets to death. Luckily this didn't work and it just led to my own sweet, merciful death. The music struggles to approach mediocrity, and the sound effects for just about everything is like needles in my brain. Playing Zodiac XX made me feel like Madeline Kahn in the movie Clue. Just flames. Flaming flames on the side of my face. This game is an assault on the senses, and an insult to my identity as a gamer. Do not waste your time downloading this game. Zodiac XX feels like a cursed game, something from a creepypasta that is only supposed to exist in screenshots on some forum on the dark corner of the internet. Save your time, save your data, play literally anything else. A Case of Distrust is a narrative-focused noir detective game from developer The Wandering Ben and released in 2018. A Case of Distrust is set in 1920 San Francisco and puts players in the role of private detective Phyllis Malone. Players are given a case to kick off the story that involves bootlegging and death threats, and it instantly pulled me into the game. Talking to characters will unlock insight into the case as well as different clues. When talking to people, you will have the opportunity to use these clues and details to get more information out of them or to spot a contradiction in their story. It's very reminiscent of the Phoenix Wright series, and it's perfectly used in this setting. I'm a sucker for a good noir detective story, and swapping Humphrey Bogart for Lauren Bacall is a great choice that really makes things interesting. The characters you meet are the kind of archetypes you'd expect from this setting, with lots of grumbling hired muscle, shady businessmen, and mafioso hiding in plain sight. Visually, A Case of Distrust is an absolute delight. Everything is presented in this noir pop art style, and it really cements the theme that the game is going for. The music helps to seal the deal, and it sounds like you're sitting in the back of a smoky jazz nightclub. A Case of Distrust isn't a terribly long game, apparently clocking in at around 3 hours or so, but even with my limited time with the game, I'm already in love. The classic noir detective setting is one of my personal favorites, and A Case of Distrust nails every aspect of that genre. Combined together with a great investigative gameplay, and a story with some interesting plot hooks, and it makes for one hell of an enjoyable adventure. If you enjoy a narrative-focused experience or really like the investigation gameplay of the Phoenix Wright series, you definitely owe it to yourself to check out A Case of Distrust. We Were Here Together is the third game in the co-op-only We Were Here series. If you haven't played the other two games, don't worry, you aren't missing any knowledge needed for this entry. Though the first game is free, so I recommend playing it at some point anyway. This is the first game in the series that doesn't keep you and your partner separated from each other. You still have walkie-talkies and solve puzzles together that require you to be in separate locations, and you'll still need to be communicating about what you see in front of you. But now you can actually see each other, take a look at both sides of the puzzle, and you can wave and point. Rather than the very segmented puzzle rooms of the previous games, there seem to be many smaller puzzles in larger areas, requiring you and your partner to find objects hidden in the environment and the next piece of the larger puzzle holding you back. My wife and I cruised through the early areas of the other two games pretty quickly, but it took us a little time to fully solve the first area of this game. The whole series is a lot of fun, but I'm excited for this bold new take and the extra layer of polish on We Were Here Together. If you have a good co-op partner and are in need of a new game to play together, this should be a great one for you. The Coma 2, Vicious Sisters, is a Korean side-scrolling survival horror adventure game. You play as a girl in high school dealing with friends, class, and boy problems. But as the super blood moon appears, everything in the school gets weird. And by weird, I mean scary. Bodies are falling out of the ceiling, hands are grabbing at you from the floor, but thankfully you can run and dodge, and both are quite effective. But, uh, I'm finding a lot of hiding places. Like, a lot of hiding places. Yes, eventually you will find enemies who will actually chase you, and they chase hard. So you'll have to keep a mental note about where the nearest hiding spot is, and if it will be good enough to conceal you. That's not all though, while hiding you have to do QTEs to control your breathing, which are made harder if you're low on stamina from running. I will say the one thing that usually turns me off super hard about this type of game is not knowing where the hell to go, especially with several floors with several doors. However, Coma 2 does an excellent job of keeping your map updated as to where your next objective is, along with save points you visited and points of interest. I didn't expect to like it much, but surprisingly, I've been having fun so far. American Fugitive is a top-down sandbox action game from developer Fallen Tree Games and released in 2019. 
American Fugitive has you taking control of Will Riley, a man wrongly thrown in jail for the murder of his father. After breaking out and reuniting with your brother, it's up to you to find out who set you up and why. Gameplay is like the classic Grand Theft Auto games, with players exploring a sandbox city environment from a top-down perspective, doing different challenges, completing missions, and generally causing chaos. However, this isn't just a modern take on the classic GTA formula, as American Fugitive has a few different ideas of its own to throw into the mix. Players can scout out and break into buildings, during which things shift to an almost turn-based kind of game, allowing players to investigate each room one by one, stealing anything useful and confronting anyone inside. The NPCs and world in general aren't as forgiving as they would be in GTA, as just getting into a crash with another car or even trespassing can cause people to take notice and call the cops. If you want to stay free, you'll need to change up your clothes and do your best to keep a low profile when you can. Otherwise, you'll be spending a lot of time running from the cops. While there's a lot I like about American Fugitive, there's just this low-budget feeling I can't shake off while playing. Controls are kind of floaty and just a little unresponsive, and it makes things like driving hard to do with any kind of finesse. Driving in general just doesn't feel great either, with the player being unsure what you can safely drive through or what's going to cause you to crash and stop. Combine this with a camera that you can't control and doesn't zoom out quite far enough, and you've got a recipe for disaster. American Fugitive has a lot of interesting ideas when it comes to reinventing the classic GTA sandbox wheel, but it just doesn't nail the details like I wish it did. It's a fun little game, but the grievances and annoyances are just too much for me to overlook, and I probably won't be spending much more time with this one. Through the Darkest of Times is a spy strategy sim from developer Paint Bucket Games and released earlier this year. Through the Darkest of Times takes place during Hitler's rise to power in 1930s Germany, and has you taking control of a small group of Resistance members trying to do what they can to fight back. Each week, you're able to assign each member of the Resistance to go on different missions. These missions can range from asking for donations to your cause, finding new members to join the Resistance, drumming up support, and making connections with leaders of the community. As your group grows and expands their knowledge and resources, new and bigger missions start to become available, such as stealing a Nazi uniform or breaking a resistant member's husband out of jail. However, these actions will inevitably draw the attention of the authorities, and if you aren't careful, it won't be long before the Gestapo come to take them away. The success of each mission comes down to balancing the difficulty of the missions, relevant stats of the members you're sending, and bonuses from different items you can send along with them. It's not terribly complex, but it's a fun balancing act that serves to keep the gameplay moving and help further the storytelling. It's also worth mentioning the music, which features a lot of wonderful classical tunes that really help to set the mood of each scene. Also, it's worth mentioning that Through the Darkest of Times is a realistic take on the setting and time period. So don't expect any kind of Tarantino twist on history where your ragtag group ends up taking down Hitler. Instead, you're presented with a smaller scale story that manages to make your actions feel impactful, while not treading all over history in the process. It's not the most deep or complex game, but the gameplay loop is well designed and manages to keep me interested in seeing how much this Resistance group can actually accomplish. Through the Darkest of Times is definitely worth checking out, and I'll be seeing this one through to the end at least once. A Tom Chef is the answer to the question, what if you tried to solve Overcooked with a Zaktronics game? In each level, you'll be given a task of automating the cooking and delivery of food orders under a certain budget, a certain number of ingredients, and a certain amount of electricity usage. Raw materials can be sent out from dispensers to be cooked on an electric grill, chopped through a food processor, or sent directly to an assembler to become part of the final meal. Robotic arms can move items from one station to another, and order monitors can manage the power state of all your devices. Can you make the most efficient solution to simultaneously making hamburgers and cheeseburgers on demand? Probably not, but if you can, more power to you. This game got real stressful for me real fast, but I can't deny I was having fun, and I had a hard time keeping myself from moving on to the next level each time I finished one. Genesis Alpha 1 certainly is a game. It's a shipbuilding resource management roguelike FPS game. You need to build out your ship with rooms to fill necessary functions, and after building these rooms, you'll need to assign workers there. Out of workers, go clone one. Out of resources to build stuff, go man the tractor beam and collect debris, or take a landing pod out to the surface of a nearby planet. The tutorial teaches you the very basic basics, and not very well. This computer keeps popping up and down with a mind of its own, and holy moly, look how much of the screen it takes up compared to how much information it's showing you. After teaching me to turn on my tractor beam to collect resources, I was told to build a workshop and then go get a turret. 
I spent a little too much time figuring out why my workshop couldn't build turrets, and my tractor beam pulled in a swarm of alien bugs, which detached the room I was in from the ship, and left me totally screwed. Thankfully, when you die, you take over one of your crewmates, which also serve as your lives. Unfortunately, all of them were assigned to the same room I had just died in, so I got to redo the tutorial and made sure to speed my way to placing a turret in the tractor beam room. Despite this, aliens still made their way into the rest of the ship, and some sort of substance started spreading through my corridors. I kept getting warnings about energy conduits being damaged, but I couldn't figure out how to repair them. It was all a bit of a mess. There's an interesting mixture of gameplay here, but I struggled to figure out some of the necessary mechanics, and I ended up having a bad time, but I'm sure it will appeal to some people in the audience quite a bit. I would love to see a Genesis Alpha 2 someday, with some extra polish and multiplayer, which could be a ton of fun. I'm picturing first-person barotrauma in space. Maybe someday. Little Big Workshop is a building management game where you manage people who build things. You need money, so you'll be looking to build stuff for your regular customers, as well as checking out the market to find products that are high in demand and make good profit, but also products that you have the means to make. When you choose a product to make, you'll go into a planning phase where you choose what materials to use and what stations in your workshop to process them at each step. You'll have to make sure your materials are good enough to meet the minimum standards, but the interface makes that pretty easy. If you're missing a station you need in order to take care of a required step, it helpfully highlights the station you need in the buy area, so getting what you need is never confusing. Your workers will start to get tired and need breaks, so you'll need to set up a break room, which you can expand out over time to be more relaxing. Bigger projects require more workers, which require more stations in use, which requires more space, so you'll start expanding, and eventually you have quite a bustling little workshop. It's not a genre I like, and the looming daily cost of workers and upkeep that I have to outearn gives me a bit of stress, but I had a pretty chill time playing this one. Call of Cthulhu is an RPG developed by Cyanide Studio and released in 2018. Call of Cthulhu is inspired by the H.P. Lovecraft story of the same name, as well as featuring elements of the Call of Cthulhu tabletop RPG. You take control of Edward Pierce, a private investigator in 1920s Boston. A man enters your office with a strange painting and a story about his mentally unstable daughter being blamed for the death of herself, her husband, and their child. The story follows the typical Lovecraftian beats, complete with an alcoholic detective, sailors telling stories of odd omens, strange visions of a tentacled beast, and a dreary and menacing setting. So far, it's nothing too amazing or new for fans of Lovecraft, but it's still got all the right plot hooks and interesting elements to keep you invested. The presentation and style of the game is also top-notch and serves to complement the story being told. This feels like the pages of Lovecraft have come to life, in the most disgusting, dark, and depressing ways. The world looks and feels like it's already under the grasp of Cthulhu, and the residents are just waiting for the tentacled Sword of Damocles to drop on them. However, while I was initially very excited to see where this game goes, that excitement began to fade away almost immediately. Throughout my entire experience, I was plagued with bugs and glitches all over the place. Audio would randomly cut out and not play in its entirety. Video would freeze while audio continued to play, only for the video to start playing at high speed in order to catch up to the sound. The frame rate was all over the place, making for a stuttering mess of an experience. Normally, if a game is good enough, I can look past the bugs, or at least understand that not everyone's going to have that same buggy experience. However, even when the gameplay is working as intended, there's just nothing here to really keep your interest. The game features an RPG system, where players can level up different skills according to their intended playstyle. You can put points into skills like eloquence to increase your ability to charm others in dialogue, psychology to understand a person's actions or thoughts, or investigation to increase your ability to piece together parts of the mystery. However, these skills' actual impact on the game seems to be minimal at best. The combat in the game is very minimal, with it being more akin to a survival horror than any kind of action RPG, so the idea of a strength stat seems fairly pointless. The dialogue skills might give you an additional option when talking to someone, but the outcome of your conversation is the same regardless of whether you had the necessary skill or not. While the story and setting in Call of Cthulhu seem like it would be perfect for me, the lackluster RPG elements and various audio and video glitches made for a very disappointing experience. I was ready to love Call of Cthulhu, but instead, I was driven insane by the bugs and left with nothing but sadness. Which I guess is the truest Lovecraft experience you could ask for. I just wish the actual game was fun. Wargroove is a turn-based tactics game for developer Chucklefish and released in 2019. 
Wargroove takes a lot of inspiration from the Advance Wars series, but changes out the modern war setting for a full-fledged swords and sorcery style fantasy setting. Wargroove takes place in a world called Orania, and features all the fantasy standards you might expect. There's knights, undead skeletons, and a vampire who assassinates the king to kick things off. The first campaign will have you taking control of Mercia, daughter of the recently deceased king and now the newly crowned queen. Apparently this is only one of 15 campaigns that you can play in the game, which sounds like a lot of content. Each campaign is focused on a different commander, so there could be some really cool storytelling possibilities depending on who those other commanders are. While the story isn't anything mind-blowing, it's a serviceable fantasy story so far. I may not be in love with the lighthearted writing or fantasy setting, but it's good enough to keep your interest in between battles. However, the main draw of this game is definitely the tactics gameplay. Much like Advance Wars, players will be moving units around a map, trying to take objectives and defeat enemies. Players can take control of neutral towns to earn more gold each turn, which can then be used to deploy more units during battle. You'll need to control your enemy's presence on the map by taking their towns and thinning their forces before going for the objective. One of the more interesting mechanics in the game is the crit system. Each different type of unit will attack with a critical hit if they're under the right conditions. For example, spearmen will crit when standing near other spearmen, archers will crit if they attack without moving, and swordsmen will crit when they're standing next to the commander. Alongside all of this, you'll need to keep track of terrain, weather, and unit type advantages. It can be a lot to keep track of, and before long, each turn starts to take longer and longer as you try to carefully plan out each move. However, this complexity is exactly what this kind of game needs, and each battle feels like a real accomplishment when you emerge victorious. Only a couple of missions in, I was already being pressured pretty hard by the AI, and I needed to take full advantage of crits and type advantages to pull off a win. Overall, I was pretty surprised by what Wargroove has to offer. The art style is charming, the music is excellent, and the gameplay is deep and engaging. The story's a little lacking at the start, but there's more than enough to keep me coming back for more. I'll definitely be putting more time into Wargroove. Hello Neighbor is a playful horror stealth game. Your neighbor is doing some really suspicious stuff, so you, a small child, decide to investigate. You have to sneak into your neighbor's house without getting caught, and to make things harder, your neighbor roams around a lot, and learns from your behavior. If you keep entering the house the same way, he'll start placing traps there and monitor that area more. It's not a game about coming up with the perfect strategy, it's a game about thinking on your feet. Which is unfortunate, because often the next thing that you need to progress is in one spot. So if he's guarding hardcore, you'll have to lure him out and hope he didn't learn a shortcut to grab you. Thankfully, you keep your items between attempts, so if you manage to get a key or unlock a door, it will still be that way when you try again. Also, sometimes after getting caught, you'll have a dream sequence that may reveal a bit about your neighbor, or just maybe a nightmare. By the way, if you try this game, do yourself a favor and check out the controls ahead of time. I played on a controller and there are a few different actions that involve tapping a button versus holding a button down, and the distinction between holding and tapping is very small, which left me confused for a while. Also, you kind of have to do a lot of platforming, and the platforming kind of sucks. Figuring out where to go next can also be kind of obtuse. However, getting a bit of progress did feel good each time I made it a bit further. Alongside this, we also get Hello Neighbor Hide and Seek, which is a prequel. Instead of your neighbor chasing you around, it's your brother as you try to complete objectives around a map. And if he sees you, he will not leave you alone. He doesn't set traps for you or figure out shortcuts, he just beelines for you. Sometimes I'd lose him, but the chase music would continue for minutes where I had no idea where he was. He really serves more as an annoyance while you solve puzzles. And hey, did you like the platforming in the original game? I hope so, because it's back with a vengeance. You'll be Skyrim climbing this mountain like there's no tomorrow. Hello Neighbor is an interesting concept visually and on paper. When it first came out, it was really popular on YouTube, and I think that's because it's more fun to watch than it is to play. There's definitely value in the IP, and Tiny Build is taking every chance they can to figure out where it will work, with multiple spin-off games, a sequel on the way, and an animated TV show. But I'm not sure if this first game is really for me. Vampyr is an action role-playing game from developer Don't Not Entertainment and released in 2018. Vampyr places you in the shoes of Jonathan Reed, a doctor who awakens in a mass grave only to discover he has become a vampire. Soon you are chasing after clues about the creature who created you and learning more about the mysterious vampire disease itself. You'll explore the somewhat open-world streets of London, investigating rumors and learning more about the people inhabiting the town. 
As you learn more about certain important citizens, you can begin to glean more information from them, and eventually decide whether or not you wish to feed upon them. This aspect of Vampyr is the most intriguing, as the whole system seems very deep and full of possibilities. Feeding on people will grant you blood that you can use to level up and learn new skills and abilities. The amount of XP you gain depends on how much you've learned about the person, quests you've done for them, and other ways you've helped them or the community. However, feeding on one of these citizens will kill them, and depending on their standing in the community, it can throw the district into chaos. Players will have to decide between feeding on people and getting stronger while dealing with the consequences, or just doing your best to help the people of London and not having the opportunity to level up as often. You can unlock various vampiric powers, both offensive and defensive, as well as upgrade your different weapons. The combat aspect of Vampire is probably the weakest element of the game, at least from what I've seen so far. You have a basic 3-hit combo, the option of an offhand weapon, as well as the previously mentioned vampire powers. There's nothing really deep or interesting going on here, and even on the normal difficulty, encounters feel like more of an afterthought. Unfortunately, Vampire can't rely on the narrative aspect of the game to convince you to keep playing because, at least for me, the dialogue is just not great. Jonathan Reed is constantly talking out loud to himself, and in the most stilted and generic way possible. Everything he says sounds so melodramatic and basic, with the most canned emotion thrown in with every line. The other characters aren't particularly well written either, but it's the writing for Jonathan specifically that stands out as the worst by far. Luckily, the game is visually interesting, and the different effects used for how vampires perceive the world are very well executed. The look of someone wielding a cross at you is one of my favorite little moments so far, as it made that old vampire movie cliché actually look like something that a vampire would fear. Overall, I'm just not sure where I stand on Vampire. I know it sounds like I might have been a little bit harsh here, but that's because I was really intrigued by the concept of this game. The idea of a slightly more scientific look at the vampire myth sounds really cool, and visually this game paints a very pretty and impressive picture. However, the lackluster writing, bland combat, and overall mediocre delivery of the final product just has me more bored than anything else. I'm going to be putting some more time into Vampire, as I really want to like this game and give it a chance to reel me in. But for now, I'd say the prognosis is bleak. So, overall, how was this month's bundle? Well, this was a surprising month for me. Most of these games were completely unknown to me before the bundle, but the ones I did know of ended up being kind of a letdown. However, despite most of these games not being on my radar, I ended up with a couple of games that I really love. Except for Zodiac XX. I don't know why there's two humble originals in the first place, but it's especially confusing when one of them is this bad. There was a great mixture of stuff here, with a game or two I really wanted to play already, a few I had heard of but figured I would pick up eventually, and a few I had never heard of. And all the games were from varied genres. There was a good balance. And hey, don't forget your subscription comes with 20% off the Humble Store. If you've been thinking about grabbing Fall Guys or Horizon Zero Dawn, you can get a hefty discount. Last month's mystery game was revealed to be Vikings Wolves of Midgard, a sort of Viking-themed Diablo game. Reviews on Steam are mixed, but I love Vikings and hack and slash RPGs, so at least this is a mystery game I'll actually play at some point. If you want to know how much each individual pick is worth, here's the retail price of each game. As for what we dropped this month, well, Humble decided that classic and premium subscribers get all 12 games, so we don't have to drop anything. 12 out of 12, GG, easy. A huge thank you to Michael Slater, Charlie Grant, and all of our patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to us. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.